Let's talk about Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. This is a very famous piece, and as you're going through ancient philosophy, you should be familiar with it and several of the ideas within, because they're going to recur again and again throughout philosophical history. So, what's salient and not obvious in the slightest is that Aristotle, in the very first line of the Ethics, disagrees with Plato, and he does so very fundamentally on the grounds of what the forms are. And so the departure from his teacher, with whom he shared, you know, 20 plus years, is really significant. It's right up front and right in the first sentence. And so Aristotle tells us that all human activities aim at some good. So they don't aim at the good, they aim at some good. So for Plato, as you might recall, the good was the form. It was the pinnacle of the forms by which all of the other forms got any kind of being or meaning. Plato even says that all the other forms and all the other things are children of the good, which is why we get this kind of rhetoric as well in Christianity. And so the good is in a very real sense the parent or the progenitor, out of which the being and the possibility of being of all other forms and all other things, including all their manifestations and all their imitations and all on down into nothingness, all of those things can exist only because of the being of the good. The good is the one. And we'll hear this later with Neoplatonism. And so the good is kind of important for Plato. And so for Aristotle to come out in page one, first sentence, to disagree with that is really significant. And so in saying that all things aim at some good, he's telling us that there are many goods and that they can all be different and that all things aim at different stuff. Now, what does this actually mean? So, one of the things that this means is that Aristotle has what we call a teleology. So, teleology from the word telos, which means end. So, this is the goal, the aim, the end of human activities of any given thing. And so, the goal of me trying to make a table is to actually have the table. The goal of skillful flute playing might be to charm and entertain an audience or to, you know, cause pleasure or something of the kind. And so, all of these things have as their aim something external to to themselves. And so that's the other key insight and piece of the first sentence that's not obvious in the slightest. So all human activities aim at some good. In other words, they aim at things, in many cases especially, outside of themselves. Now, the possibility is there that the good that they aim for is themselves and that there is an activity for which it is its own reason for being. And I think it's pretty easy for us to think of examples of this, right? I mean, think things that are fun and I want to go on vacation ultimately because I want to have fun in certain ways. And so does that mean that, wait a minute, it's not the activity then, maybe it's the act of having fun. What is, why having fun? Oh, pleasure. Why would I want that? Oh, because it's, you know, has a positive valence. Okay, so apparently I want things that are positively charged in terms of experiences, things that are rewarding. In other words, stuff that I like, stuff that I perceive to be good. Okay, well now all of a sudden it sounds like we're aiming at something that is any, gen any given category of, uh, of human goods. And so you see how this kind of trace back goes. And this is what Aristotle is encouraging us to do is say, okay, you know, why do you want a car? You know, you want a car so that you can get places and so that you can have status and have whatever. And oftentimes the reason that we want things is for the sake of something else. In other words, the telos of that thing lies outside of the thing itself. And so that's important. And that's important in a way that gives us a what's called, broadly, a teleological account of the entire world, which means that everything in the world has a why. So everything has a reason for its being. It has, in his you know, description of the causes, a final cause. What is the final cause of something? Which, it, it sounds like a piece of philosophical jargon. I mean, what it really means is the why. Why does something exist? What is the reason for something existing? Okay, well, I built this table. Why did I build the table? Well, it wasn't as an end in itself. It's not like it's just an aesthetic object, although that may be part of it. It's also so that I can set stuff on it, so that I can have meals on it, so that I can do things with it, so that I could sit on it, or maybe even break it down and make other stuff out of it, whatever it might happen to be. So everything has reasons 
ways in which it can be used, and then reasons for its being created to begin with. Well, the idea that everything in the world has a reason for its being implies that everything has a purpose and that everything has a goal associated with it. And so, part of the explanation in terms of knowledge about a thing, Aristotle is going to tell us that our knowledge of what a table is is incomplete if we do not also understand its final cause. So we have to understand the reason for its being. We have to understand its purpose. And this leads into a discussion of function. And this is what's called the ergon argument. And so the proper ergon, the proper work, activity, or function of a thing is its purpose. And so what is the final cause of, you know, a table so that I can set stuff on it? What is the final cause of a knife so that it can cut things? And this is crucial for the ancient Greeks because their notion of virtue, arete, was excellence. What is excellence? Well, it's not just excellent at anything, right? I mean, a table could be a hammer, but it's not a very good hammer. So, but that's not part of the reason for a table existing. In other words, the telos of a table is not to be used as a hammer. And so its virtue, its excellence as a table is not measured in terms of how well it can be used as a hammer which means that we need to consider for the purposes of excellence and trying to assay just how good something is, we need to consider only the virtues that are appropriate to that thing. And this might seem entirely obvious, but it, it's not obvious anymore if we consider what it means when we talk about people. So what is the arete of a person? What is the virtue, the excellence of a person? What does it mean to be an excellent person? What does it mean to be a good person? And this implies some notion of what is the final cause of a person? What is our purpose? What is our meaning? Almost, not quite. What is our telos? What is the goal and aim? What was the purpose of human beings being here at all? And so you'll notice if we flash forward a couple thousand years and then some, this is precisely the point that Sartre moves against. So Jean-Paul Sartre is, is the philosopher in the 20th century who would say that, no, 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 um, existence precedes essence so that the essence of what that thing is can be defined afterwards, so that human beings are a kind of blank slate and we can define the meaning in our lives afterwards. But this is precisely the opposite, and that's the reason I mention it. It's precisely the opposite of Aristotle. So for Aristotle, everything has a purpose that was given to it as a function of it being created and being the kind of thing that it is. In other words, the essence of that thing Implicit in the essence of that thing is its final cause. The why of its existence is implicit in what it means to be that thing. And so for tables and knives and chairs and all that, it's perfectly obvious. But for people, it is not so obvious. What is the excellence that defines whether or not someone is good, is virtuous? That's not clear. And so for this, we have to look to, well, in philosophy and trying to figure out, you know, what in the world's going on? What does it mean to be good? What does it mean to live a good life? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So for Aristotle, the good life, and this is a term that is unfortunately translated in all the editions that I've seen, but it arguably shouldn't be. <laughs> so the term that Aristotle uses is eudaimonia. And eudaimonia means something like human flourishing, to live well. And unfortunately, in some translations, we get happiness. And people will say, oh, well, happiness isn't the purpose of human life. You know, that's not, that's not deep at all. There's got to be more to it than that. Well, yeah, and that's not what Aristotle meant, <laughs> right? So living well, overall living well in accordance with the excellence that is appropriate to, that is proper to, that is the proper ergon of a human being. That's what's meant there. And so human flourishing and virtue comes from the exercise of that excellence. And so the word eudaimonia has two parts that we can easily recognize. So the EU prefix just means good. And daimon, the root of the word, refers to spirit, divine. It's the word from which we get demon. And so it's, it's kind of a peculiar word for happiness, right? But I think it's a little easier to understand if we think of it in terms of perhaps blessedness. So the idea that we are living a blessed life, well, that has connotations of some things that are outside of our control. And indeed, this is actually the case for Aristotle, that he thought that the, your ability to live a good life is not wholly within your control. So it's not just you, it's also some fortune, circumstances that surround you. So 
for Aristotle, this is not a terrible way of thinking about it. Now, I'm not suggesting that you translate it as blessed, but it's a nice foray into trying to understand what's going on. So I think human flourishing is nice. So living well is nice. Those are ways of translating eudaimonia that are actually meaningful and help to, you know, steer us in the right direction in terms of thinking about what Aristotle had in mind. So that's the ergon argument. And the ergon for humanity, he suggests, is reason. <laughs> and so we are exercising excellence and being excellent people being good and attaining to goodness insofar as we exercise reason. And in retrospect, if you think about it, it's like, okay, what is he going to recommend? He's a philosopher. Kind of, you know, you can kind of see it coming, right? He's going to recommend the contemplative life. He's going to recommend the exercise of reason, of course, exemplified by doing philosophy and thinking. So there, there it is for that. Now, the other part of the Nicomachean ethics that is well known and that everybody should be familiar with is the idea of virtue itself and of the individual virtues as manifest as means between the extremes. And so for this, we need the ideal of sophrosyne. And sophrosyne is moderation. And so this is the mean between extremes. And Aristotle discusses all of the different virtues as being kind of midpoints, where it's possible to have too little, and equally well, it's possible to have too much. Now, that's not normally something that we think. When we normally think about the virtues, we think about something that is good. And obviously, if it's good and it's a virtue, I want to have more of it. I want to maximize it, right? I want to have as much of the virtue as I possibly can. But for Aristotle, it's not about maximizing something. It's about balancing something. And the balance, the moderation of that virtue, the sophrosyne, is where the virtue is to be found. And so he invites us to consider a number of examples. And so courage, I think, is the, the easy one, even though one of the words we don't really have a, a good word for. So if we have too much courage, then arguably that makes us rash, where we're overly bold and willing to put ourselves in danger in cases where it's, it's just stupid. And yeah, I mean, clearly you don't want to do that. So there is an excess of courage understood in that way. But there can also be a deficiency, and the deficiency is something that everybody knows, right? We call that cowardice. And so if you have too little courage, you are a coward. If you have too much courage, then you are rash. And so the truth, the virtue, and excellence in terms of human functioning is found in the balance. It's found in moderation and striking and finding that point of unstable equilibrium. And so that, I think, is, is kind of interesting with respect to the way that we think about virtue. It's certainly a different way of thinking about what human goodness is in finding a balance of things, not just maximizing the good, but actually thinking about the appropriate action as a mean between extremes, as something that we can miss on either side, not just being deficient, but also in excess. Now, that being said, how in the world do we get there? So Aristotle emphasizes habit in this. And the story that I absolutely love with this was from a, uh, a toy. And the toy was translated, and so this is a modern, like, you know, little child's toy. And the instructions for the toy were translated from another language by someone who did not speak English. And uh, you know this because <laughs> the toy advertised itself in saying that you can train your bravery. And you picture like, you know, one of the big wheels or something, a ride on thing that a, a small child can have. And you train your bravery by, by playing with this toy. Well, that phrase, train your bravery, is not something that, that's just not the way that we normally think about it. Like, we kind of suspect that somebody who joins the military and goes through basic training and whatnot, they are being molded and becoming more courageous as a function of their experiences. But are you training your bravery? Like, are you training your courage in the same way that you would train to become a better musician or train to become a better baseball player? It's just, it, there's a little bit of friction there in terms of the way that we normally think about the term. And I think that's really productive, which is the reason that I mention it here, because that's how Aristotle thinks about it, is that we can train our bravery and that we can train our virtues in a variety of ways such that we actually become better so we get closer to the good by virtue of exercising the excellences appropriate to our ergon, in other words, by exercising reason and by finding that middle ground, by finding the sophrosyne, then we are able to determine how to live courageously. And that happens by virtue of 
habit. And so we have to train ourselves to do this. It's not just a matter of an intellectual understanding, in other words. It's also a process of training. And so this is something that we don't often find very natural in terms of thinking of the desires as something that are malleable. And so do I actually have control over? Can I actually change my desires? Uh, some people, the knee-jerk response is to say, yes, you know, that's how you become a better person. But have you tried it? You know, have, have you tried to change one of your desires and make it to where you don't like something anymore? It's not as easy. You know, it's not as easy, right? Which is why I suggested going into this by thinking about habit. So habits are things that we are accustomed to thinking about changing. We are accustomed to thinking about, okay, I want a good habit, and so I have to practice diligently the same thing over and over again every single day in just the right way so that I get the right habit. That's the sort of thing that in music, for instance, or in athletics, that's what we think of. You have to have a lot of reps, right? And you have to have those reps not just on one day where you're cramming for an exam or something. You have to have them over time so that the brain can, you know, incubate that ability and it can slowly build over time as you're literally building the connections we know now, right? So you are getting better over time at this particular skill, whatever it is that you might want. And we call it a skill when it's a habit that we want, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we don't often call bad habits skills, but there's a sense in which you've become good at being bad at something. <laughs> so maybe we should. But for Aristotle, this includes not only physical habits, not just playing the piano and things of that nature or throwing a baseball, but also habits of thought and emotion. And so we can become better at having chains of useful habits of thought and emotion that conduce to living well. And that's the kind of thing that he has in mind here, and arguably that's the sort of thing that's happening in something like basic training, where you are being taught, trained, virtue. So... Perhaps that, is, perhaps that is useful. Now, one of the things that we also get in Aristotle that's slightly different than what we get in Plato is the idea of the Akratic. And so the Akratic, akrasia, so kratos is uh, ancient Greek for power. And so a means not, the prefix means not. And so you are powerless in this way. You do not have the power to, in this case, resist a particular desire, a particular impulse. And so the Akratic person is someone who knows what's best to do. So you've intellectualized what's good and what it is that you should do. I might know what virtue is, and I might know that virtue is not eating the chocolate cake at midnight but I am powerless to resist the temptation and my own desires. And so I eat it anyway, or I do whatever it might happen to be anyway. And so Aristotle appeals to this very intuitive aspect of human nature and experience, whereby I know what's best, I just can't bring myself to do it. And that might seem perfectly obvious, but for Plato, this is not what we hear. So for Plato, knowledge is virtue. And so if you know what's best, if you genuinely know what's good, which begs the question of what knowledge really means for Plato, then you cannot help but to do it. And so you were drawn ineluctably to do it. And so the exercise of virtue then is the same as knowledge, which means that Plato can say that a lack of virtue is the same as ignorance. And so this is just not the case in the same way for Aristotle. So that's another important uh, idea that we get in the Nicomachean Ethics that you should be aware of.